it's exciting to talk about uh, relating to our indigenous peoples um, in, in other countries such as the United States and New Zealand and uh, some of that work we have done with uh, uh, what is known as IDEO with Wayne uh, Garnos Williams and, and also to talk about uh, intellectual property is, is Merle uh, Alexander from Miller Titterly uh, but uh, I think they're, they're really um, important and um, you know these these two matters are, are quite important and, and discussion of trade as our indigenous peoples to other indigenous peoples in different countries is 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 the new way I believe and looking forward to to asserting our, our sovereignty and our self-determination and our relations with other uh, indigenous brothers brothers and sisters in, in different countries so thank you and I, I pass it on to uh, Derek yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, thanks, Chief Terry TG, and congratulations on your recent uh, re-election. I'm really happy to see that and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, Ace Whale, Wheelielik, Tell Schools Wheelielik. My given name is Derek Epp, and I'm the Chief of Chiacton First Nation, which is part of the Chukwaeg Tribe and the Greater Stalo Nation. Uh, today, I'm really honored to be, uh, and thank you to the BCAFN for asking me to moderate today's session. I'm really honored to be presenting or um, moderating the session on a focus on Indigenous trade and intellectual property as economic development leaders. And today I'm here to introduce you to our two um, presenters, the first being Wayne Gar uh, Garnins Williams and the second being Merle Alexander. Uh, we will have both of them present um, and then we will get to the Q&A section. I'll do a brief introduction of uh, both Wayne and Merle. Uh, Wayne has quite the extensive bio and background, so I'll, I'll shrink it down a bit, but uh, Wayne is the founding president of International Intertribal Trade Organization, senior lawyer and principal director of the law firm Garwell Law Professional Corporation, and leads an international business entitled Indigenous Sovereign Trade Consult Consultancy Limited, specializing in tribal trade and sustainable economic development. He is, the, he is the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business 2019 Award winner for excellence in Aboriginal relations, the 2020 Queen's University Alumni Award winner, as well as the recipient of the 2020 CISDL International Legal Specialist in Peace, Justice and Governance Award. He is Plains Cree from Treaty 6, Musumin First Nation. Merle, Merle Alexander is a partner with Miller Titterly & Co. Alexander practices Indigenous resource law, uh, focusing on Indigenous sustainable development. Merle is a member of the, and hereditary chief of the Katasu First Nation on the mid coast of British Columbia. <clears throat> Active within his community, Alex Alexander is a former director and president of the Vancouver Native Housing Society Foundation, has served as a chief negotiator for, the U for a UN Indigenous Caucus, and was also a director and president of the Vancouver Child and Family Services Society. He is a recipient of business in, in Vancouver's 2009 Top 40 Under 40 Award and a UVic Distinguished Alumni Award. Alexander holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Law from University of Victoria. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Wayne to kick us off. Uh, just for everybody's reminder, if you have questions, just throw them in the Q&A. Um, we'll be happy to get to them um, at the end of the presentation from Merle. So with that, I'll hand it over to Wayne. Thank you, Wayne, and looking forward to the presentation. Great, thank you. I, I'm Wayne Garnons williams I'm chair of the International Native Trade and Investment Organization. We've been around for six years. We're a 5013C educational non-governmental entity. And its sole goal is to educate uh, First Nations and uh, provincial provinces, states, federal governments, nation states about the opportunities for the exercise of uh, the economic right of intertribal trade and how we can foster and, and grow that. So um, my presentation basically has uh, three things you're going to take away from them. That's well, First of all, I'll cover the current climates. Uh, I'll be looking at traditional knowledge in the context of an in intellectual property and finally emerging opportunities with respect to Indigenous trade. Um, I'd like to start off my presentations with a, a very short simple statement that says if you're going to remember something remember these things and the thing that I, I, I kind of like to take away with here is if you're going to remember these things it's that this is like putting a square peg into a round hole traditional knowledge into intellectual property. Shortly, it, it, quite frankly, it doesn't fit. So why? Because of four points. Intellectual property regimes exist to protect individuals and corporate interests in research and development of a company's products and without regard or consideration to traditional knowledge because it was designed and invented as a, as, as a regime without consideration to traditional knowledge. 
uh, intellectual property regimes fail to recognize this, uh, fail to recognize completely traditional knowledge concepts. So um, also traditional knowledge is not fixed in time like intellectual property. Intellectual property basically protects uh, an individual or a company for a fixed period of time for a fixed product so that their input costs, their investment, they can make back their investment by, sell, by an ex, having exclusive rights to sell their products. So, uh, so it's a, it's a, as I say, the intellectual property protection is for a specific individual or company for a fixed period of time, like 15 years or 20 years or something like that. This doesn't fit with respect to traditional knowledge. So um, let's go back a little bit and talk about uh, climates and the, the current climate. We, we know that the environment is one of the most important things that uh, Indigenous people have always emphasized and that the rest of the world is finally trying to catch up and trying to say, looking, poking their head above their, their economic interest and saying, you know, we can't continue going on the way we're going on. And I, I point to the major environmental fiascos like British Columbia's Mount Polly mine spill, 2.5 billion gallons of tailing waste into the Fraser River, Dakota Access Pipeline, $3.8 billion pipeline uh, in the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe um, with the destruction of burial sites and jeopardizing drinking water, um, the Wet'suwet'en and traditional chiefs, elders and land defenders versus coastal gas link, the 6.6 .6 billion versus uh, uh, economic development project. All of these are economic opportunities, but also environmental challenges. And the problem is that Indigenous nations globally want economic development, but not at the expense of our regional climate, water, air, and quality of life. So we can't forget the fact that the federal government has come back in this, this era. This, this era is uh, in the history books, we'll look back at this era and say, wow, what a bunch of opportunities that were potentially missed. And I, I use, for example, the first time ever a, a sitting prime minister has put as directions for every single minister in his cabinet this statement, quote, no relationship is more important to me and Canada than the one with Indigenous peoples. It's time for renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples based on recognition of rights, respect for respect, cooperation, and partnership. And so that statement in the ministerial letters had to be translated back down to the deputy ministers in the form of to-dos and, and reports and review and, and, and results. And then that got split up into the ADMs and then the, 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 the directors general and then the directors. And it all went down the, 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 the line for getting results and feeding that back up the beast to meet their performance measurements. That was this, this, this period that we're living is uh, historically unique from a public administration standpoint to get real progress done on getting economic development in a way that Indigenous people look at economic development. So the, it's just that's the climate we're in. But let's look at as well the climate we've had with respect to uh, the intellectual property regime and international trade. Uh, the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades in 1947, the, uh, the United States Free Trade Agreement in 1987, NAFTA in 1994, the World Trade Organization in, in, in 1995, and TRIPS, the, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights in 1995. None of this, none, not a single one involved consultation with Aboriginal people at all. So it's, it's, that's the kind of roadmap we're dealing with where we're coming late to the party with respect to a complete system of, of, of intellectual property that's already been established. And now we have to say, okay, can we fit this square peg into the round hole? It doesn't work. So you, 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 everyone knows this. I mean, it, BC's UNDRIP has been, been put into law and hopefully Canada's hopefully will go into law. But I wanna emphasize just, uh, you know, 20 sub one and 36 sub one dealing with economic uh, the, the, the economic aspect of the Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and develop their own economic uh, systems. But as well, it's 30, 31 sub 1, which is really important with traditional knowledge. Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their traditional knowledge. They also have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their intellectual property over traditional knowledge. So that's really cool, and that's really crucial. How does that play out? Well, we'll I, I think Indigenous peoples can shape that. Uh, in, in, in the way it gets applied. So let's look at, uh, first of all, before we look at options of how to shape uh, not putting a square peg in a round hole, uh, 
we need to understand the the intellectual property regime itself. Like, th there are some basic concepts of what a copyright is, um, or, or, or um, uh, let's see, there's the, the, the a patent as an agreement between an inventor and the public, uh, represented by the federal government, in return for a full public disclosure of the invention, and the inventor is granted the right to a fixed period of time to exclude others from making, using, selling, or defining the invention. I've already explained that concept, so you, you get that there's an exclusive right for a specific individual for a specific period of time, uh, so that they can make their money back. Um, so I'm just going to uh, the same sort of thing there. I'm just going to go through that quickly because uh, I'm short on time here, but. Uh, Let's look at the world in uh, WIPO, the, the, the World Intellectual Property Organization's definition of traditional knowledge. I think that's really important. Um, the, 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 their definition is based, it's all traditional based literacy, artistic, scientific works, performances, inventions, scientific discoveries, designs, marks, <clears throat> names, symbols, undisclosed information, and all the other traditional based in innovations and creations resulting from intellectual activity in the industrial, scientific, literary, and artistic field. So what's that really mean? Well, that that actually, when you look at their, even Whippo's definition, uh, it goes beyond what an intellectual property regime would cover. So that's really important to understand the fact that we've already we're already beyond that little tiny hole of intellectual property with respect to traditional knowledge. So it's really important to understand that it doesn't fit. So what, what does work? Um, well, I, I, I kind of like the Panama, the, the government of Panama has a de definition of traditional knowledge, the collective indigenous rights, um, where they, meant, they emphasize that there's no known author and there's no date of origin. Remember, and, and, and I, I'm preaching to the choir here, when everyone knows that traditional knowledge is uh, a collective right uh, owned by uh, the, the, the community, and it's uh, an interest that started from time, immem from, from time immemorial and goes on in perpetuity. So that doesn't fit for the intellectual property regime. So, so what does work? Well, um, let's look at, first of all, a little bit of an example here. Here's uh, uh, the, 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 an example of the couch and sweater. Um, th there's been, I guess, uh, a bit of a problem with respect to the couch and sweater because it, it is such a wonderful product that non-Indigenous companies uh, have, have gravitated towards it as a means of uh, wanting to profit from it. And they did not consult with the Kaohsiung people. And so uh, they just went ahead and just did their own thing. Now, you can see on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the picture on the left, there's two couch and sweaters. The one on the far left is the original couch and sweater, an example of, of, one, of the, one of the styles. And the one on the right is the product from the, I believe, um, uh, Polo. It's an authentic, they call it a, a couch and cardigan. For, and, and the problem was um, that they, they, they went and they produced this. And, as a, and, and only as a result of the hard work of the couch and people in, in focusing on the fact that they've stolen their, 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 their traditional knowledge and they're profiting from it, that the, the, the Polo company removed the name Cowichan from their sweater. So it just became a cardigan. But at the same time, they still were able to make a profit from the uh, intellectual property or the traditional knowledge of the indigenous couch and people. And there was no sharing of profit and there was no negotiation. They just an outright theft. And, and as a result of the current intellectual property rules, it, they, they can't get uh, a rightful claim to it under the current existing regime. So what can be done? Well, um, First of all, we need to look at the fact that there's been theft happening everywhere. Um, there has been since uh, European context to today, widespread commercial exploitation of traditional knowledge, especially in the pharmaceutical, agricultural, cosmetic, artistic design, entertainment industries, and the retail market sectors. Uh, indigenous groups since the 1970s have been quite vocal in their complaints about the lack of adequate compensation, loss of community rights, misrepresentation of products and practices, and fraudulent indigeneity, and the unauthorized public disclosure of secret traditional knowledge, images, and other sensitive information pertaining to Indigenous communities without any right of, uh, of, 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 of uh, protection. So, uh, one of the things I, I looked at, I was trying to find what kind of things are out there that we could use to make, uh, to, to not make a square 
square peg fit in the round hole, but maybe find some sort of domestic opportunity that we could use. So I came across the writings of Stephen Munzer, Professor Stephen Munzer. He wrote The Uneasy Case for Intellectual Property Rights and Traditional Knowledge. I nicknamed it the Munzer Model, and it's for protection of traditional knowledge domestically within the nation state. And what this is, is basically legislation where there's a bunch of things that are, there, that are there, but point two is really important to start out with. Point two, basically, Indigenous peoples have a right to claim their traditional medicines, health practices, minerals, plants, animals, folklore, folk art, crafts, techniques, knowledge, biodiversity, genetic material as their own. And that's, that's a starting point, that that number two, paragraph two, is really important. And then they have the power to make binding rules on others for access for it. Um, and the power to grant access, if they so choose, to, to companies that they want to negotiate with. So, and, and then it goes on to say that there, if the Indigenous peoples and its members have a claim right to receive compensation for the granting of that, and, giving, and once they give their informed consent, um, then if, if, if the, someone tries to take it, to take their, 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 their traditional knowledge uh, improperly, then they have the power to seek royalties, compensation, damages, equitable relief in the form of an injunction to prevent that company from, 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 from using that product or that idea. And the nation state has the power and the duty to fine and prosecute those companies or offenders that are improperly using their, the, the indigenous traditional knowledge. And the next aspect of that is with respect to the concept of the, the round hole of intellectual property. Copyrights and patents protected by, by the laws of the host nation state, there's an exception to indigenous peoples that can be exempted from the folk works, um, the, from, from the usual copyright requirements. And to prevent the patenting and the use of their, of their medicinal compounds, for example, so that there's an out, a domestic out. And finally, there, there's immunity against expropriation which the state can't come in and say, oh, well, you know, because there's a whole bunch of political pressure being brought to bear by whatever it is, Pfizer or whatever. We're gonna go and take this uh, and you're, you're, we're gonna waive this and you're, you're, you no longer have the, the opportunity to, to claim the, uh, the, the right. Well, that immunity right would, uh, that, 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 that immunity against expropriation would be there in, in plain, plain, plain writing. And finally, the, uh, the whole concept of these rights I remember I said that with respect to intellectual property, it's for a specific product, for a specific person, for a specific period of time. Well, these, the, 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 these rights, liberties, and powers of traditional knowledge would go on indefinitely. So that's the Munzer model domestically for protecting um, traditional knowledge in, and, and, and basically to run alongside an intellectual property regime that we've, we, we, we were late to the party on. Um, so let's apply it. Let's see how it works in application. Let's go back to our, to our couch and sweater. Um, so I'm gonna take you back a little bit with respect to a little bit of history that happened. Uh, the 2010 Winter Olympics and the Bay. Um, back when the 2010 Winter Olympics was gearing up, uh, the government of British Columbia said, you know, we're hosting this and it'd be great if we could get some in indigeneity involved and maybe get an indigenous product that could represent uh, the spirit of win the Winter Olympics. So they called upon the Cowichan people to come up with uh, a Cowichan sweater that could uh, symbolize the uh, Olympic Winter Games and the, the, the coming together of, of, of nations. So um, the, the Cowichan people put together a prototype. And the picture on the left, of course, is the picture of the prototype of the Cowichan sweater. The person holding it, of course, is the ex-premier Gordon Campbell and uh, the other person who's looking down uh, is uh, Jacques Rocher, the president of the International Olympic Committee. So that was all going well, but all of a sudden Hudson's Bay realizes, you know, um, we see money in that and we don't want to lose our market share. So they created a controversy by claiming that, you know, the couch and knitters, you know, we love them, but, you know, I think given the demand, we, they couldn't possibly meet the demand. So uh, I don't want to burst your bubble, government of British Columbia or IOC, but you know you really want some organization that you can depend upon to provide a quality product and the numbers that you need. So the powers that be, uh, province and IOC, got scared, 
and they backed away from uh, doing the couch and sweater, authentic couch and sweater, and they went with the bay, uh, the bay sweater, which is the one on the right-hand side with the little Olympic mark on the shoulder. Uh, so they won the contract, and they uh, they 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 sold this in, in during the Olympics. Now, if we had the Munzer model in place, the Couch Nation could have their their indigenous traditional knowledge confirmed in a certificate that they then could take and go to the bay and say, oh, excuse me, um, one, here's a cease and desist, and two, we need to negotiate what kind of revenue we're going to get with respect to cost sharing because you're clearly ripping us off. And so there, there's an opportunity for that that could have happened. Um, but for, of course, the, the lack of uh, uh, a Munzer-like model. Um, th there is, of course, people say, well, what about the, the U.S. Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1939? Well, that, that's useful to an extent in the sense that uh, to, to apply that if we had a Canadian version of that, that'd be great. But the problem is there's no exceptions to the normal intellectual property regime of patents, copyrights, and trademarks. So the Indigenous people are kind of uh, still ha are still trying to fit a square peg into a round hole with respect to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of the United States. So that's... That's that little example. Um, but let's transition from that and look at global indigenous markets. Now, um, it's kind of cool because, I mean, the, the tie in here is the fact that we need to solve traditional knowledge protection if we're going to be a global trader, because we're going to be taken advantage of if we do not have our protections in place. It's that simple. So that's one of the things that's outstanding right now, boys and girls, and we need to focus on that to address this issue. Um, the, uh, so, because what's happening out there is some really cool stuff. Um, as you know, um, the government of Canada working with various organizations, including BCAFN and IDEO developed the Indigenous Trade Chapter as part of uh, Canada's inclusive trade agenda, which went into the NAFTA negotiations. Unfortunately, the Indigenous Trade Chapter didn't get in this, this particular time period because of the Trump regime, but we're hopeful because it's a really good product that uh, when uh, Kuzma gets, that's what's called now Kuzma, Kuzma gets uh, uh, opened up again in three years, uh, the Indigenous Trade Chapter will be uh, put up there front and center. And the other cool thing about that is when we when we got into a tra uh, trading table and we negotiated it and we found we weren't going anywhere, the government of Canada said, don't worry, don't worry. We love the concept. We've been working it collaboratively together and we're going to take this and shop this around the world. And if we can find other nation states that have indigenous peoples uh, that are receptive, we're going to lead with the inclusive trade agenda, specifically the indigenous trade chapter as negotiated collaboratively so that we can get real trade going. So that's really cool. And the result of that is, for example, the, the, the uh, <laughs> I had to change this, the third time in history the, the, of the world that indigenous economic rights to international indigenous trade will be recognized in a binding international agreement is Mercosur, or the Mercosur agreement that the government of Canada has been negotiating and still continues to negotiate. It's expected they'll finish negotiations sometime next year. But one of the first things on the table of negotiations was the Indigenous Trade Chapter and happy to say lock, stock and barrel, it got in and we all have an agreement. So it's in place in Mercosur right now. And Mercosur includes New Zealand, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, and Mexico. So that's really awesome. And that's coming down the pike. Um, so the thing is, though, we need to get that internal house in order to protect our traditional knowledge. Um, yeah, other things that are evolving. I remember I said it was the third one. There's two others that are outstanding that are indigenous trade agreements. One is the in New Zealand, the Maori of New Zealand, uh, or Aotearoa, and the indigenous Taiwanese. That was signed July 10th, uh, 2013. The second one, again, is the Maori of New Zealand, of Aotearoa, and the Indigenous Australians. That was signed February of this year. And both of them deal with Indigenous to Indigenous trade opportunities that both nation states will explore. That's cool. Uh, the other thing that's a major development is this wonderful woman in the bottom left-hand corner. 
Uh, as of November 6th of this year, the government of New Zealand uh, appointed this, this amazing leader, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Hayana Mahuta, the first Maori to hold such a position. So where is Canada with respect to this? Well, there's a, Canada's in a cool position. We have an Indigenous trade chapter that's out there being shopped around. We have New Zealand that's already been leading on Indigenous trade. And so Canada has involved itself in um, uh, the, I guess, the Inclusive Trade Action Group, which is a group made up of Canada, New Zealand, and Chile, where the Indigenous trade chapter is being brought, toward, brought to the three to make an agreement so that hopefully uh, something will be happening soon. So that's really cool. Hey Wayne, I yeah. hate, hate to cut you off. I know your, your, I, your passion for this is really shining through as well and it's a really interesting topic. Uh, for the sake of time, are we able to, to wrap it up here really quick and then we can move on to Merle and get to some Q&A? Yeah, um, very quickly, just the economies. Um, in the Maori economy is 50 billion uh, in, in uh, in assets comprised of ownership of forestry and fishing and lamb. The Canadian, according to CCAB, Canadian industry is 31 billion in Canada's GDP is indigenous. The, uh, the US tribal Oklahoma, so the US tribal economy in uh, 79 US tribes located in three states. I don't have them all. There's over, there's a lot more states than that, a lot more tribes with the, the, the data I have. Uh, 79 U.S. tribes, three states, $17.9 billion in cumulative economic impact. That's an awful lot of trade opportunity. So with that, we need to really move forward and capitalize on that. But we can't really do that properly without getting uh, confirmation of Indigenous trade. Uh, so it, so in, 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 sorry, traditional knowledge confirmed and secured. So in closing, I'm just going to quickly go to that. Um, fitting traditional knowledge into intellectual property is like fitting a square peg into a round hole. But if nation states like Canada and New Zealand that have indigenous peoples in their boundaries build and use their own domestic Munzer model laws to enforce domestic traditional knowledge systems as part of their international indigenous trade regime, this will be a significant step towards protecting indigenous, indigenous traditional knowledge and can be a start for real meaningful intertribal trade. So there we go. Uh, awesome. Wrap it up real fast. Thank you very much, Wayne. I really do appreciate it. And there's a lot of good information in there and uh, definitely stuff I hope that everybody can take away and uh, and really learn from. Quickly, there is one question. I might as well get to it right now from Christopher Stanley for you, uh, Wayne. Inter-tribal uh, inter inter trade with other nations. When we speak of trade with other nations, is this with regards to just services or does it deal with other resources? Uh, yeah, intertribal trade uh, is is a wide open definition, and the cool thing about like like traditional knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge evolves over time. Indigenous trade, intertribal trade, yes, two hundred years ago it wasn't services. Today it's goods and services. So to say that intertribal trade is something that should be locked into a time period of seventeen sixty two is absolute bunk. It has to evolve and, and, and to have modern trade, modern intertribal trade would include goods and services. Thank you, really appreciate you getting to that. And thank you guys for having the patience on that. I figured there's one question and I might as well get to it now before we move on. Um, so hang in tight there, Wayne. I'm sure there may be a few more questions after Merle's presentation. Uh, and well, without further ado, we'll hand it over to uh, Merle Alexander. Thank you, Merle. Thanks, Chief Ep. I'm just going to hopefully have a smoother. Maybe not. I'm just happy. I, I'm just happy I didn't follow uh, follow Mark because he was so fancy uh, with his with his transitions. Let's see. Are you seeing the screen right now? No, I'm not, not yet. seeing the screen. Not yet. No. There you go. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, uh, good morning. Good morning, Chiefs. Good, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Elder Joseph. Uh, I think it's all your words are really poignant. And, and we obviously are all uh, um, rising to the challenge. And I really loved your message of sort of resilience. Um, I actually have generally sort of some, some general thoughts about, about, about the resilience. I think that this time, particularly for the timing for this economic development forum, it are sort of perfect because I think, you know, Indigenous peoples have 
tremendously prospered in adverse circumstances in that sort of like this sort of hostile economy <laughs> that we often are participants in and that we succeed in. And that the fact that the playing field has somewhat been leveled right now and that if we are in a time of sort of rebuilding and recovery in, in, the, in the BC and Canadian economy is, is sort of the like, is, is sort of the standard playing field which we succeed in. So I actually have a lot of optimism that Indigenous peoples are going to do tremendously well in this time period because of that sort of message and underlying core of resilience that, that we will harness to continue to succeed. Um, with that said, I wanted to jump into the subject matter of today, uh, the intellectual property rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, my colleague before me has already sort of covered a lot of the basics and I'm really happy I had the, the privilege and opportunity to sort of see his presentation in advance knowing that he would cover all the sort of core areas of intellectual property and place that sort of in the context. Um, just as by way of introduction, actually, one of the reasons that, I, that I've like found so much interest in this and why this is sort of almost like a niche part of my practice is that in, now I'll start dating myself, um, in 1998, when I was still in law school, um, I was doing some work for the Inu Nation who was in self-government negotiations in Labrador. And one of the subject matters that came from their negotiation table was that they ran up against a federal mandate, the mandate of Canada, saying that intellectual property jurisdiction is a non-negotiable subject matter. So they were essentially wondered aloud, like, what's the legal basis for this? So they said, they brought that question back to their lawyers. I was a student at the law firm and they said, well, answer this question, Merle. Is, this, is there any legal basis to this? So as a student, I researched the issue and found like so many Canadian uh, positions or negotiation positions that there's no legal basis to that position. That since Garen, the subject matters for self-government jurisdiction are remain open-ended, including intellectual property jurisdiction. There's a bit of a disconnect there between the fact that Canada does recognize Indigenous peoples have rights to cultural and heritage jurisdiction, but they don't recognize that we have intellectual property rights jurisdiction. So anyways, that work accidentally had me stumble into, while I was still a student, into the work, work of the World Intellectual Property Organization and the work of the Convention of Biological Diversity. So for 10 to 12 years, as sort of a, on, on a pro bono basis, I participated in both those two UN forums, which actually touched very much upon the like my main reason for being involved there is I was very interested in looking at international instruments that might be harnessed for the protection of indigenous knowledge. Um, alongside of that, domestically, I've been doing lots of work working on sort of uh, treaty negotiation support and heritage chapters. Um, one of the things I'm sort of a little bit like in some circles known for is the development of indigenous knowledge protocols. So contractual agreements is sort of fulfill that basis. If anyone's particularly interested in that, you can send them, send your email or to me later, and I can send you a sort of template indigenous knowledge protocol that we often sort of open share. Anyways, that said, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right into my presentation and hopefully be able to sort of answer some very uh, loaded questions that I was given. So I think people are immediately sort of wondering, like, what's the role of the Declaration of, uh, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, given that this is obviously the context that, 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 that we're looking forward to, that's the main implementation tool for different British Columbia. Um, as the, the regional chief um, um, so notably uh, said, we are just a number of days away from the first year anniversary of the Declaration Act as it was brought into force on November 28, 2019. Um, in its basics, the, the Declaration Act requires British Columbia in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples to one, ensure new and existing laws are consistent with the UN Declaration, two, develop and implement an action plan to achieve the objectives of the UN Declaration, and three, monitor progress through public annual reporting. There's also a very substantive component under Section 7, which enables the BC government to enter into uh, consent-based uh, 
consent-based agreements between the province and Indigenous governing bodies. So you might start seeing a dramatic sort of consent framework. I think that area in particular there might is open and I know some we're working with some indigenous groups already in the north that are developing an information sharing protocol for their indigenous knowledge that is consent based and that's currently being negotiated right now with, between those three nations and um and and the province of British Columbia so I think there is some opportunity for section 7 to particularly apply particularly on indigenous knowledge related issues which there's less resistance to acknowledging the Indigenous people's consent is absolutely required in that context. So I've been asked some three very sort of uh, loaded but very, I think, like relevant questions. Uh, can DRIPA, the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, advance intellectual uh, Indigenous people's rights to intellectual property? So IPR of IP. Um, well, I think the, the short answer is yes. I think yes, uh, DRIPA affirms the intellectual property rights that are set out in Article 31. Yes, it creates a powerful legal tool to challenge Crown jurisdiction that are not, that as they are required to be consistent with UNDRIP. Yes, it serves as a territorial limited basis to apply our legal orders. Um, yes, with the incoming UNDRA federal bill, a mechanism to advance the provincial and federal initiative of legal reform. So that, uh, what I mean in that particular sense is that as, um, uh, as many of you likely are aware, most of the intellectual property uh, statutes are federal statutes. There's a lot of sort of cultural heritage related sort of rights. This is one of those areas where, where like the sections 91 and 92 uh, don't particularly harmonize very well, particularly when the way that we as Indigenous peoples would protect our our um, our Indigenous knowledge and our and our rights. Um, but I think for you for there to be effective legal reform on intellectual property, it would require coordination between both um, both the both the the federal and provincial governments. And if you're going to start trying to amend things like the Copyright Act, Patent Act, Trademark Act, those are all federal statutes. So you, it won't be DRIPA alone that will fix that. It'll take a combination of a legal reform initiative that deals with both provincial and federal jurisdiction. Um, lastly, I think that like one of the, like uh, whether DRIPA can advance uh, um, indigenous, Indigenous people's rights is I think that we really may have need to make it a priority um, as Indigenous peoples that we want to start really substantially occupying the jurisdiction um, of protecting our knowledge, developing our own laws, and really sort of getting to what is a, one of the most absolutely fundamental elements of UNDRIP, which is the affirmation of the right to self-determination. So the um, the next question that I was asked was, do First Nations, uh, sorry, I can't read my own question because of the way this screen works. Um, do First Nations require um, national and international, like an international, that international um, coordination among Indigenous nations to advance IP reform? And I would say yes. Um, the I think the most empowered and challenging work ahead of us is is that, as I was saying, the reinvigoration of our own Indigenous legal orders. Um, we often invoke our law, but we still really need to do a lot of that hard work in our, in our nations, in our, in our, within our nations, of creating written living forms of our legal orders, including that which applies to protecting our own Indigenous knowledge. Like on that, I think that BC First Nations, there's a pretty wide spectrum, like it, in, some First Nations have been doing this work like for 15 to 20 years, particularly because they've been in, being because they have so much resource development in their in their areas. So constantly, the, their TK is constantly being asked uh, or being utilized in a variety of sort of regulatory regimes. So some First Nations have a, are, are quite advanced in their level of TK protection. They've developed their own sort of 
essentially codified laws. They have their own policies. They have template traditional knowledge protocols. They've developed their own institutions. And then you have other First Nations where they where doing that sort of work of sort of protecting their own indigenous knowledge is sort of at its very infancy. That's not to say that there isn't a very living body of law that already applies. I think that is in fact the case. Like that's one of the most fundamental elements of here is that we need to get, we need to really bring to life that element of UNDRIP that affirms our right to self-govern and our right, getting back to what originally brought me into this work, our right to, to have jurisdiction to protect our own knowledge. So, I mean, our laws are still living and do exist. It's just that I think right now, First Nations of British Columbia are at different places in the spectrum of to the extent to which they are already trying to sort of work within their own, their own laws. Those laws remain living for everyone, probably equally. It's just a matter of that sort of, I don't know, for lack of a better term, like that sort of codification process is at different points of sort of the chronology. So, I mean, I think one of the like, um, elements of things that we, that we really need to sort of work on together is developing legal mechanisms that level the playing field and then allow other players to lift each other up as necessary. So I think Indigenous groups working together to sort of say, this is what's been working for us in terms of protecting this particular type of Indigenous knowledge. This is the process that we, methodology we've used for, for developing our own laws. That sort of information sharing is really necessary. I mean, that obviously requires a lot of humility and trust. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's so many areas, and British Columbia is, a, is, is a, and I think, still, like, a great environment for that, because I think that you'd be hard-pressed to find a region that, that coordinates better internally than we do. So I think that we are up for that challenge. Um, I mean, I think the, the, continu the, the continued sort of isolation, the isolationism of single First Nations will fail. I mean, there's just only so much that a few nations can actually do, and, and you're really only, you're limited, like, in geographic scope. I mean, I think one of the most important things, I think, for Indigenous groups to keep in mind is that um, the courts have affirmed that one of the strongest evidence of a right is when another, when there's reciprocal recognition by another nation. So I think there's really an opportunity for Indigenous groups to start considering uh, developing a BC-based like mutual affirmation treaty of our rights to Indigenous knowledge and that might be a real positive step. If we were able to sort of like sign on to something of something of that sort of sort, you'd have that sort of reciprocal, uh, reciprocal um, affirmation element happening at least to our knowledge. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to sort of, it, it's, it's not as challenging as trying to have province-wide title, title recognition. It's much more specific to Indigenous knowledge. And I think that if we're going to make any significant advances, that really has to be done in a collective way, not in, as individual nations, because we will just sort of maintain that wide spectrum if we sort of continue on our current path. And then uh, the last question that I was asked was like, for trade purposes, can we balance maximizing our economic rights to our intellectual property and still maintain the integrity of our culture? And I, the answer there too, I think is yes. I think balance can be achieved through development of our own intellectual property lives based on our own indigenous legal orders. Um, I think arguably the like, balance is required of us um, as all rights have an inherent obligation to preserve them for future generations. I think that that sort of, I don't think that if you're, if we are to follow our own laws, I don't think that we can knowingly destroy the very essence of our culture to, for economic purposes. So I think if, um, I think in other words, I think that, you know, that that's, that's in some respects, that's something that's like inherent to all, all nations. Um, Indigenous or not, like is that there's sort of a general premise in international law that you don't break your domestic law for international trade. And I think that would be the same approach that Indigenous nations would take internally, uh, amongst themselves, and internationally. So like uh, among in Indigenous nations, I think that that sort of mutual affirmation of our right to protect culture and trade, I think with other groups is required. And 
on this last point, I think that in, you know, that that's in some ways just an affirmation of our history that indigenous peoples have always shared by consent, their cultures with each other in big houses, through powwows, by ceremony and around campfires. So I think in many respects like this full circle is something that we are in sort of a journey of a full circle. And this is something I think which is a, is sharing is part of our cultural beliefs. It's just a matter that it be shared with our consent. And with that, I will open it. I'll, I've left room for questions. Yeah, thank you, Merle. Really appreciate the presentation. Uh, detailed, a lot of good information. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in right, right off the hop here. So uh, Barbara Morin, you, um, you stated we need legal mechanisms that lift us up. What are the legal mechanisms that lift us up? Well, I think that, um, I mean, I think right off the bat, I think we just needed, like, like uh, at this point, I think we need, a, you just need some affirmation by the BC government that Indigenous peoples own and should control their Indigenous knowledge. I think you sort of, as a basic sort of affirmation, like in the same way that sort of the, the concept of rights recognition, like as a starting point has to be, has to be a main premise. That's one sort of core point. Then I think that, you know, I was talking about earlier about like a project that we're doing with, with, with three nations up in North, in Northern British Columbia, where, um, where the, the, the Taltan, the Cask and the Tlingit are currently negotiating with the province for a consent based information sharing agreement that requires capacity and that it requires a mandate for the province to sort of ent start entering into those types of agreements. And right now, I think, like so many things that are happening in British Columbia, they're just sort of one-offs. So, I mean, I think like developing that sort of as a legal mechanism across across the province and expanding that beyond what is probably more like a pilot project type of approach, um, I think is another potential legal mechanism. And then thirdly, I think, you know, there is just seriously a capacity issue. I think that the province should consider developing, whether it be by legislation or how, however means, the development of an actual sort of capacity fund that would allow Indigenous groups to start doing that like hard work of working through their own Indigenous legal orders and determining for themselves what are those, what are the ways that they want to protect it. Like most groups start off with sort of soft law elements of developing things like policies, protocols, then enter into contractual based agreements and then start looking at codification. In some respects, you sort of have to start soft and then go hard. <laughs> Sorry, that sounds a bit graphic. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> hard law. <laughs> I mean, the, the, main, the, main, the main like thing that I think you have to start to that sort of like more potent like um, approach to the things by, because um, um, you learn, there's a lot of learning in, in sort of developing your own policy. There's a lot of, work, I think, that in, you know, the average digital group sort of needs a sort of understanding how just sort of that basic, like, level, like, 30,000 foot level of, like, saying, it's all collective knowledge, the nation owns it, end of story. Like, that's, a, I mean, that's sort of, a, like, maybe a, a starting point saying that it's collective knowledge, but then you need to start understanding through policy work what the actual familial relationships are to particular types of knowledge. And that's, you can only sort of start doing, you can only develop that by actually sort of like sort of like being in the implementation process and then moving to something more codified. Anyways, for it. Yeah, I'm no, personally you, distract them. I appreciate you uh, having a bit of a sense of humor through that one as well. <laughs> Always good for a laugh before, before lunch. Um, you know, Wayne, Wayne did ask if he could address the question as well. So Wayne, I'll hand it over to you to uh, expand a bit on, on Merle's answer as well. we're dealing with intellectual property law that's global. So uh, when we're dealing with indigenous international trade, which is in, can be counted in the billions of dollars, we need to protect our traditional knowledge that goes into our products and services, in, not just domestically within Canada, but globally. And how do we do that when we've got a dominant global intellectual property regime that doesn't allow us in? We're late to the party. That's where we need to have 
mutual domestic enforcement between trading nation states that have an indigenous trade chapter where that section respects traditional knowledge between the two trading nation states so that tribal nations between those two, two trading nation states have the same ground rules of, for example, the Munzer model where you can have that protected and still have the regular IP system run alongside it for everything else so that the, the nation state is not getting to trouble by uh, the, 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 the global IP regime. It's more, this is an exception because we were not consulted and we have unique circumstances and therefore our indigenous trading uh, is protected through a protection of, of a traditional knowledge in a model that, that steps out of the traditional IP system and allows for that exceptionalism between nation states that are trading. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. I appreciate you expanding on that as well. And um, I had a question come in uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, the culture and language is a sacred responsibility as shared by my knowledge keepers to share it because the creator gave us the unique gift, our own languages and culture. And therefore, it is our sacred obligation to share it and teach it to our people and others to ensure it lives on for generations. So how do we get access to researchers report that is, that is a copyright protected to reprint our, to, uh, for our members like dictionaries. And they're able to utilize indigenous people as gatekeepers for access and use, especially ones using indigenous gatekeepers to restrict access. Yeah, that's yeah. a difficult, a difficult um, situation. And that's happened many, I think some of the worst circumstances of um, indigenous knowledge being restricted, like comes from those type of examples where stories or something have been sort of documented and put into story form. And then because of the, the way that the intellectual property system works and gives rights to authors before, instead of like source, um, copyright ends up being held by the actual author, the person who documented it versus the person who actually told the story. I mean, that's happened to, you know, I mean, some very famous, from very famous, like famous people have been sort of like wronged by it. And obviously that's a, one of the worst examples that does happen in, in British Columbia and elsewhere. I mean, I think um, we, we've dealt with this sort of circumstance before, like for clients and our most direct approach is essentially just to start off with like demand letters on behalf of the nation to, to, to the author and to, and to the publishing company with the threat of litigation. That they that they assign the copyright to the original source back to their or or provide some sort of a minimum like indefinite license agreement to allow the nation access to it. That has actually worked like ninety nine percent of of the time. I mean, I think the less the lesson there is, and we put this into like every single time, like at least one of our clients hires a consultant who is going to be accessing indigenous knowledge. Is you have to put very specific language in that any work product assigns all copyright of the original source materials back to the nation. So that if that's like one part of your contract regime, the way you approach people who are going to work with your knowledge. And then two, that you don't have that sort of like half that sort of forced retroactive sort of approach. Um, I think like, like anything, anything can be negotiated. If, and I think that so far, like, I think that sort of the forcefulness of that seems to be working I don't know about the international context of that, whether or not that's been successful or not. I've only really sort of dealt with sort of local national authors where that was an issue. So and most of the time they sort of bolded on the issue because it's obviously pretty embarrassing that the actual indigenous people who you're documenting are, can't even access their own stories. So it's, it's got a lot of like, sort of public sort of fervor for you to access also. Yeah, I appreciate that Merle. And uh, Wayne, anything to expand upon that? Yeah, in the era of reconciliation, there is an obligation for universities and university uh, publication houses to step forward and to take a good look. If, if a First Nation wants to claim access to a publication that was done, published by a university, uh, by Professor X from University of X in, in, their, in their publication house, um, the, the First Nation can lead prima facie evidence that there was not a consensual 
um, uh, information that was gleaned from the First Nation. And in a spirit of reconciliation, the university should open that up for access to that First Nation to have uh, unrestricted access to that to that information. And I think there's a causal link there that can reasonably be established between the the fact that, let, let's say, um, oh gosh, what's this one guy? Uh, gosh, I can't remember his name. Th there's this one great author uh, that, that wrote extensively about uh, in, in the interior tribes of British Columbia in about 1900. It's clear that that individual didn't get any consent, just observed his or he observed the various trading aspects that happened and observed, observed the ceremonies, wrote it down, it got published, and then a university holds it. So there was no, con the, 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 tri the, the First Nations can make an argument, prima facie, that the, there was no consent. And therefore, there's an automatic presumption that it should be opened up to the First Nations where their information is in that, in that text and that it is available to them to access. Yeah, thank you, Wayne, for expanding on that. And uh, I really do, for the sake of time, I guess we're already at, at noon. Um, it is a quick lunch break for everybody. I do really want to thank Merle and Wayne both for your guys' uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge with us and, and really sharing your experience. Um, you know, I, I think you, you touch on some really key points and how we can come together as, as tribes, as nations, as a province to really advocate for, for some real change. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's timely for all of us to move forward in that direction. And I think it does start, start in our own communities and our own nations here and, and helping to rebuild our tribes and nations. And, and hopefully that will ripple effect into, into the province as a whole as well. 